Well, good morning, everybody. How you doing? This is Jeremiah, and we are having another webinar today, continuing our series of real introductory stuff for people who are new to Land Effects. Um, I think we will probably even touch on a couple things, even if you've used Land Effects quite a bit. I'm sure we'll hit on some things that you might not have been aware of, but this is definitely geared to people who are new and really want to kind of step through what the heck is this thing. So you are in the right place if that sounds good to you. Um, I have a couple quick notes here before we get going. Uh, first, this is being recorded. So if you miss any part of it, that'll be available on the website um, no later than Monday. And uh, please, we, we really rely on your questions. So note there's that Q and A button right there at the bottom. That stands for questions and answers. If you click that right now even, um, you, know, you can see you can get it situated on your screen because it's gonna great a, make a great uh, companion as you watch the webinar, because you'll also see any answers that we type to other people's questions. So, um, uh, and also just be quicker to type in a question if you have it up and ready. So uh, just do keep your questions there rather than in the chat window. So that's why I like to tell people, go ahead and click it now. Um, other than that, um, you know, Strap in, get ready. This is going to be fun. And hey, Paul, let's uh, let's start the tour. Hi, uh, thanks, Jer. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to another Land Effects webinar. As Jer said, we are continuing the Land Effects basic series here. Let's move forward. That first slide is always a doozy. Uh, my name is Paul Houchin. I assume that if you're watching this webinar, you're a new user uh, looking to get yourself familiar with the software and how it works. Um, so just a little bit about me, if you haven't seen me before or heard from me, uh, I'll give one of these webinars every once in a while. Uh, mostly though, I'm dabbling in different departments here. I help with the creation of marketing and graphical aspects of the company and have a knowledge of landscape architecture. So I help with the development of content that is featured within Land Effects. And because I kind of know how the system works, I'm available to uh, help our users with various uh, usage support questions and issues. So if you call in, you may talk to me. Uh, last week, uh, Amanda started the series off with a webinar titled uh, 101, The First Steps with LandFX. Uh, she gave some information on what LandFX is, how you can install it, and some points that can uh, help you uh, save time and make your workflow more efficient. She also provided some files uh, that are full with uh, Land Effects items for you to play around with. Uh, with these, she showed some basic drawing setup. Then she wrapped up the presentation showing things like using a base file as an external reference, create a new project, and uh, even adding a concept object to the drawing. So we're gonna be kind of jumping off from there, and I will be using uh, the base file from that file set if you do wanna follow along. So here's the outline for today. I'm gonna to start off with uh, introducing some <clears throat> key AutoCAD items that are going to be uh, relevant to the following presentation. Uh, I'll jump into CAD and show you uh, some of the main uh, land effects managers and explain what those are there for and how to use them. Uh, that'll lead into finding and placing actual uh, land effects content into your drawing. And once we kind of get our feet wet uh, with those, those ideas and, and see it in action, I'm actually gonna pause and take a big step back and kind of show a little bit of what's going on behind the scenes, um, just to, to give a, a better understanding of, of everything that's going on when you're using Land Effects. And at that point, I will uh, pause for questions. And then we will wrap up the show by just going through a tour of uh, some of our basic uh, but also super important tools. And then that'll be it. So starting off with some uh, just basic CAD knowledge, uh, we're gonna look at the ribbon. So this is what the ribbon looks like in 2020. Uh, the color may be different for you, uh, depending on your settings or maybe what uh, year of CAD that you're using, but essentially it should be the same. And uh, as you can see, it's a horizontal array of panels containing buttons with tools. And the ribbon is it's just a term for the menu system that AutoCAD utilizes to organize all of its tools. 
Um, the ribbon is organized by tabs, as you can see at the top, uh, which consists of several panels. And within those panels uh, are all the buttons, which correspond to tools that you use within CAD. And many of these, these buttons have a little arrow that indicates that it is a flyout menu as well. So if you click on that arrow, it'll bring down a bunch of um, different tools uh, that should be related to that initial tool in the ribbon. And of course, uh, LanFX uses uh, all of its tools within the ribbon. And this is kind of like the main interface for using LanFX. So when you apply LanFX to your AutoCAD workstation, uh, it adds on these several FX ribbons and those hold all the tools that come with your LanFX installation. So let's go into some LanFX content basics. The, uh, the first thing that I want to just touch up on real quick uh, are blocks. And blocks are just groups of AutoCAD objects like uh, lines, arcs, hatches, etc. that act as a single object. So in the image below, you can see that the uh, table, there are two tables here. Uh, on the left, we have the table that is not a block. It's just a bunch of individual geometries. Um, and after saved as a block, it is now a single object. So when you're using it, it's treated as a single object versus a bunch of separate lines and circles and arcs. Uh, blocks are copied around in a drawing, but uh, even though there are multiple instances of this block, uh, it's all referencing the same definition as you can see here. So we have six different tables in the drawing yet they're all referencing that same uh, initial block definition. Uh, on the right there, you can see it in the, uh, the blocks palette manager there. And why is this good? Um, it optimizes your drawing because your computer only needs to process the one definition. So even though the object is repeated over and over and over again in your drawing, um, it's still just referencing that one definition. So you can kind of think of that as, as there are six uh, blocks in this drawing and that's kind of what your computer is seeing, you know, in, in a very simplified version, but uh, you have six entities here um, versus if it was, you know, just those geometries separated, it would be over, and this is a rough estimate, but over 276 individual geometries. So it's, it's optimizing uh, your drawing there. And so that's why LandFX uses blocks for the majority of its content. Uh, so that your drawings are as streamlined as possible. Uh, next thing I just wanted to touch up on are uh, hatches, because this is the other thing that I'll be showing today as far as LandFX content. Uh, hatches are just solid colors, gradients, uh, or patterns that are used to fill areas within AutoCAD. And LandFX uses hatches for items such as ground covers, concept areas, paving, and surface materials, areas for drip line, uh, anywhere in plan where you would you know, draw a boundary and have it filled with some sort of area. Typically, I'll be using a hatch to represent that. So um, when we jump into CAD here, we're going to be, I'm going to be showing uh, XREFing in the base file from the drawing set that Amanda provided last time. Uh, but I will be using a blank drawing. So you don't necessarily, if you don't have that base yet, or if you threw it away after last <laughs> presentation, uh, don't worry, because we're still gonna be setting up a new drawing. So it's not super imperative that you have it. Uh, but if you do, and you wanna XREF that in and have your monitor look like mine, go ahead and do that. And I'll show setting that up real quick here when we jump into AutoCAD. So let's do that. I'm just gonna switch my screen here. Um, here I have uh, FXCAD open and I just started a new drawing. And so the first thing I wanna do is, uh, you know, the first thing you wanna do whenever you set up a new drawing in any CAD situation is you wanna verify your units or set your units um, to the ones that you wanna be working in. And so to do that, I uh, just type units into the command line or if you just type UN, that'll bring up the units dialog box as well. And because we're doing a landscape plan, I'm gonna be working in decimal feet. Um, 
So set yours that way or set it to whatever units you'll be wanting to work with. Okay, and now let's add that xref base, um, which is something that Amanda showed last time. So hopefully you're familiar with this. There's a couple ways you can do this. You can uh, type in fxref, which is the LANFX external reference command uh, in the command line, which is what I typically do. Or if you want to use the ribbon, head up to the top here where it says insert and click on that tab. And about midway through the ribbon, there's a fxref tool there and just click on that. Uh, you, now you're prompted to select the reference file. Go ahead and navigate to that base file, which I just have on my desktop. Um, and make sure you're choosing the right uh, units here. I'm working in decimal feet. And I just wanna bring in that base file. Click open. And this is the cool land effects xref box here. Um, if the units were off on my xref, it would tell me that I have a mismatch of units, which is a bad thing to do when you're working with xrefs. Um, but since our units are matching, uh, everything is pretty much set up and ready to go. I can just press OK. And now I've got my external reference in the drawing. Um, something I like to do whenever I bring an xref into a drawing is just verify that it's scaled correctly. Uh, that way you're not drawing on top of it and then realize later that something's you know not set up properly. So I just want to take like a known distance, say one of these parking stalls should be around nine feet wide and I'll type the DI command for distance. And then I'll turn snaps on, which is O snap. Uh, and what that does is it allows you to snap your cursor to uh, endpoints or other geometries. Uh, and so I just wanted to snap to one of these parking stall lines and this one. And I should see down at the bottom, well, that one's 10 feet. But I think that's more or less proper, 8.8 .8 feet. Um, so I know that, you know, it's not 12 times too big or too small that I'm working in the, the same units. So it's good to, to verify your, your XREF scale when you bring it in. Okay, now that we've brought in our XREF, Let's set a plot scale to the drawing um, because this is going to uh, designate what uh, scale our hatches come in or our labels. So it's important to set a plot scale upon setting up a new drawing. And to access that, go to your FX admin tab or really any of your tabs for uh, land effects. And it's gonna be the scale button. So if you're an FX admin, click on the scale button and give it a plot scale. Um, give it whatever scale you want, anything that you think you can work with, even if it's going to change down the road or if it's going to, you're gonna add in multiple scales, uh, set up one that is gonna be kind of the overall uh, starting scale here. So I, I always work with one equals 20 feet and click okay. So we've set up our scale, got our xref in, set the units. Now I want to create a project for this drawing. To do that, and this is a recap of last webinar, head to your project list button here in the FX admin tab. Click on that and it's gonna bring up in uh, the box with all of your different projects uh, that are already created. If this is your first time using LandFX, this will be empty. Um, so all we wanna do is just create a new project. Go ahead and click the new button. And I'm gonna give it a unique name. Uh, the name doesn't necessarily have to be unique, but the number does. So I'm gonna just give it a, the month and the year. And then just call it webinar 102. And I'm gonna ignore detail folder for now. Um, I'll go give it a default preference set and then click OK. Um, I'm not going to preference sets today, so just set it to one of the defaults that you have. Uh, if you have Imperial with your installation, use that, or if somehow you're advanced and you've already set up a preference set, go ahead and use that. Um, there should be a, a customization webinar coming up here in a couple of weeks that is gonna go deeper into preference sets. 
um, but that's not in today's curriculum, so I'm skipping that. Just choose one of the defaults if you need, and then click OK. So now we're going to explore the Land Effects Managers. And uh, what the Land Effects Managers are is they are um, like palettes for your materials. Uh, for like if you're in irrigation, the irrigation manager is the uh, say box of equipment that you'll use uh, to hold all of your different uh, equipment and then place those into the drawing. If you're working in the planting manager, it's the planting palette uh, to which you'll you'll paint the landscape. Um, and to start things off, we're going to go into the ref notes manager. Uh, ref note stands for reference note, and the uh, reference note manager is located in the FX site tab on the very left hand side. All of the uh, managers for our different ribbons or modules are located on the very left-hand side of the ribbon. Um, the goal of that being that uh, you typically want to work from left to right when you're in a ribbon. And so the very first thing you do is you fill up your palette of materials or the things that you're going to be placing into your drawing. So the ref note manager is now open. I just clicked on that. Uh, if you drop it down, it's it's the uh, the top option there. And notice that it is empty. And um, I skipped over this, but what uh, the Refno Manager is for is for your your site objects uh, or areas. So things like uh, site furnishings, amenities, uh, ground plane elements like mulches and paving, or even like uh, linear items, walls. Uh, uh, fencing, uh, stuff that would go on your, your site development plan would be kept in your reference manager. So because it is empty, I'm going to click on new and start adding in some objects. Uh oh. Let's, uh, let's, ah. So our, our uh, reference notes are split up into four different categories here within this box. Uh, we've got notations, amenities, lengths and then uh, area volumes. The uh, notation part of the ref notes dialog box is uh, it allows you to create a note for an item. Um, that note you'll place a, a call out for in your plan. So in your, your plan drawing, it'll be uh, displayed as, a, as just a call out with a number, um, but that'll correlate to whatever data that you put in from this box. So if you put in a note for an object, you can then call that object out in your plan. And then when you run a schedule, uh, all the, the notes, uh, the number, and any of the other data that you apply to that, that notation uh, can then be read in the schedule of the plan. So it doesn't actually place an object other than an actual call out. Um, but for this example, I wanna start by placing a table into the plan. And so that's gonna be located in amenity. So if I click this top button here for amenity, it's going to bring up a uh, web-based dialog box. And um, you can click on generic or custom to uh, add in your own data. It'll basically just revert you back to this box where you fill everything out yourself and then assign a symbol from our generic blocks library. Um, but I'm actually going to choose one from a manufacturer. So under generic and custom, there are uh, several manufacturers that have given us their catalogs to uh, show off in the system. Uh, so you can actually browse through their catalogs without leaving CAD and pick actual products from them. Um, so let's, let's choose a Maglin furniture here. And that just takes you deep into this catalog. You can uh, organize or filter out site furnishings, uh, planners, site improvements, um, or then like the different categories of items. So let's just go to tables. And then here you can click on the series icon or you can, let's make this a little bigger, navigate to the series on the left here. So I wanna choose one of these. Um, let's choose this recycled plastic model. So once I navigate to a product, within the manufacturer's catalog. Um, I can click on it, it'll tell me what the model is, and then also a description straight from the manufacturer. 
uh, for that item, if I click on more info, it'll actually bring up the manufacturer's website for that product. So you can actually look at what they what information they have. And so it's a little more detailed here. Um, but if I wanna add it to the project, I just click on add to project. And now this uh, reference note data box has been filled out a little bit with the description. Um, there's already a symbol assigned to it because it's a manufacturer uh, product. There's already a block assigned to it, so you don't need to assign your own symbol to it, but you're welcome to click on this box and then navigate to a new block. Um, and I'll show how that works more with planting when we get there. Uh, moving down from the description, you can give the table or whatever it is a unique number. You can assign it to a division. So if this is a table, I might want to put it inside furnishings here. It's going to give it a number automatically. And the more that you add in, uh, this number should change to make it a unique uh, number. If you know a cost for it, or if you want to do like an estimated cost, you can, you're welcome to put that in. I don't know how much it costs, maybe a little more. Um, you can give it a cost, you can set it a detail. And uh, these user fields, that's gonna be more uh, preference settings. So <laughs> we're not gonna go into that right now. So whenever you have your, your product in, just click okay. And you'll see it enter into your RefNote Manager. It's still not in the drawing. It's just now this product is placed into your project data. Um, if I want to place it in the drawing, all I got to do is click on it and then click the place button. Or I can double click on this uh, entry here. And just like that, a block for that table, which was created by our content team, is uh, put into your drawing. And to place it, all you gotta do is click. So if you click once, the table is now in a uh, kind of a rotate state. So I can move my mouse around and uh, give it whatever angle I want it to sit at, and then click once again to set that table. Uh, if you are placing it, and you want it to stay at the angle without rotating afterwards, just click once and press enter or space bar or right click and it'll, it'll go revert back to that initial uh, angle. So we have a couple of tables in here. Maybe they're, that's not how you would actually put them in, but uh, they're in the drawing. So that's how you get those, those tables in. Let's, let's place now a different type of ref note Let's place an area ref note. So instead of clicking on amenity, I'm gonna click on area volume. And once again, brings you to this box where you can uh, navigate through various manufacturer catalogs. But let's say I just wanna put in uh, concrete paving. I don't wanna specify what the manufacturer is uh, for what I'm putting in. So I'm gonna click on generic custom and instead of taking me to a catalog, it takes me to our uh, default hatch patterns here within LandFX. So I can now search through these different hatch patterns and choose one that I feel best represents what I'm placing in. I'm just gonna choose this pattern, click okay, but it's blank. So let's give it a little description Maybe that's what you want it to be. Uh, give it a division. Paving. Concrete. Gave it a unique number, P-101. And I can give it a cost. Um, if I want it to not just be an area, but a, a, a volume. If I want the basic land effects to calculate what the actual volume of the concrete is, I can give it a depth. Uh, concrete, maybe I want four inches uh, deep of concrete. So I would put that in there and click OK. Or if you're just calculating square footage, uh, you just leave that blank and then the volume won't apply. So now I have my ref note area. I can start placing that in the drawing. 
but because it's not a block, it's a hatch pattern, it acts a little bit differently. So go to place as you would the block. Um, but now I want you to uh, bring your eyes down to the bottom of the screen. This is the command line. And this is super important to keep your eyes on while you are working in AutoCAD. Uh, because whenever you're using a command or a tool, uh, it's going to give you directions on how to use the tool, or it's gonna give you various options to use that tool uh, more effectively. So right now it's telling me to, to select a polyline to hatch. And so if I already had a boundary line drawn, uh, and it, it could be a polyline, it could be a, a circle or a square, or some kind of uh, shape, uh, as long as it's a closed boundary, I could click on that and it'll fill the hatch pattern within that boundary. Um, but because all I have in here is my XREF and some blocks, I don't have a boundary set yet. So I actually wanna draw the boundary on the fly. Um, so if you look to the right of the uh, command there, it, there are two options. You can draw or use the multiple option. Uh, we'll ignore multiple for now. Um, but also notice in draw that the D is um, in blue. And what that indicates is that you can press the D key to use the draw function. Um, don't go down here and click on it because that doesn't work. That's just gonna cancel the command. So instead, press the D key, and now the command line says to click a start point. So now I can simply start clicking around, and it's gonna basically give me a polyline, and I just click points and start making that boundary for my concrete pavers. Let's just say it's this area here. And now I, to close the, the boundary, because it has to be the closed boundary, um, I'll just draw my uh, last point here and I'll press enter or I'll right click or press space bar. Um, just don't press escape. And uh, it'll basically automatically draw a line from the last point you click to the first point that you clicked and create a closed boundary. And then once it does that, it will fill that area with a hatch pattern. So now I have concrete pavers in my drawing. Um, and then the other item for ref notes that I didn't go into uh, is the length items. Now, this is, uh, it acts the same way as, use, as entering a uh, generic area or notation in that uh, you simply fill out your notes for the item. Um, you can give it a division, uh, but you'll wanna give it a layer. You'll give it a unique layer that, uh, and any lines that are on that layer will, will be uh, attached to this length item. Um, and again, this is good for, for walls or, or fencing. And instead of placing a block or hatch pattern when you enter it in, uh, you'll be actually just drawing a straight line. Or if there's lines on that layer already, those, those items will turn into that ref note item. So look into that if you're curious about line items. But let's go to the plant manager and add some plants in. So we can actually close this ref note manager here. And again, Planting Manager is on the left-hand side of the ribbon. Um, if you hover your mouse over a button in the ribbon for long enough, you'll get an expanded uh, description of what that item is. So if you're ever curious about a tool and maybe you're unsure about clicking it or you've clicked it, you're not really sure what you're supposed to do with it, hover your mouse over it for a bit and you'll get a nice description of, of what that tool is good for. So let's open up our Plant Manager. Now in here we have uh, our plants. This is how, how we will manage our plants within the, the project. Uh, it's broken up into trees, shrubs, shrub areas, and ground covers. So let's add a tree. Uh, similarly to ref notes, you wanna click the new button and this will open up not a manufacturer's catalog, uh, but it will open up a, our planting database. So now I can search for my plant that I wanna add in. So I'm gonna add my favorite tree. Maybe it's not the, uh, 
best tree for, for a lot of uses, but I'm just going to type in a partial botanical name. Um, you can also just type in a partial uh, common name or any part of the plant and it'll, it'll filter out uh, the hits for that, that search criteria. So I want to add in the, the floss silk tree. This one here. Once I have my plant chosen, um, I just want to hit add to project. And it's going to add that into my, my, uh, my plant manager. Now uh, notice here, I got an indi indicator that it has been added. If I want to keep adding more plants, I'm welcome to research. Maybe I want to put in an oak. I can search and then put in an oak tree of some sort. Hit add to project, it'll add it. And when I'm done adding plants in, just press done. Uh, if I miss some, I can hit new and add more plants in afterwards. But so I've, so I've added in my tree, um, but I've just added in a tree. So I, I don't know what the, the data behind it is. So before you add it into your drawing, let's take a look at how it's you know, represented in the system. Click on the edit button. Um, and the edit button is also available in the ref note manager. To go back to the, the data for those ref notes, just click on the edit button. So hopefully you kind of see a pattern of how the managers work. They're kind of very similar uh, across the different modules. So here's our, our tree information. We've got the botanical name, common name. This is a unique plant code. It needs to be unique per plant. Um, and various buttons to alter it. You can change the plant to a different species. You can edit the plant code, you can edit the name, you can add remarks to your plant, you can change the group that the plant lies in, uh, you can give it a cost. But uh, if we wanna just put in the drawing, the most important thing we need to do is give it a symbol, some way that it's represented in the drawing. So with 2D selected, click on this blank square. And what that's gonna do is it's gonna open up our uh, tree symbol library. And we have thousands and thousands of symbols in this library. Um, and if you look down below, you'll notice that the command line said it's about to download all these files. And I will show a little bit more about this uh, a little bit later, but basically um, this is a new installation of land effects and these are slide files. And because I had never opened this before, uh, the system downloaded all of those slide files so that I can view them in this dialog box. And so you can browse through all of these symbols and choose whatever one you want to use for that. Let's go up to the top. I just want to choose the most simple symbol. Click OK. I'm going to leave it at 20 feet. Once I have a symbol assigned, I can double click on this or I can click place. And then you just basically place by clicking your mouse, your left mouse button. Uh, when you're done, press enter or you can press escape. And now we place some trees. So let's go into ground covers, which is gonna be similar to the uh, area or volume uh, version of the ref notes. So first go to ground covers up top, click on new, and I'm gonna find my example plant here. Diamondia, add the project, click on it, hit, hit, et. there we go. Uh, hit edit to bring up that plant information. I think I was clicking a little too fast there. And we have our, our basic information again. Again, you can totally customize this. Uh, I'll give it a plant spacing, 12 inches on center. And I wanna once again, choose a symbol uh, this time. Instead of blocks, it's gonna bring up my hatch patterns. So let's give it a hatch pattern. Click okay. And now instead of drawing the area on the fly, I want to actually fill in a pre-drawn area or a boundary line. So what I wanna do is just fill in this circle. There's a couple of ways you can do this, but probably the simplest way is just to type circle in the command line and draw a circle. And then click place. Okay. And instead of draw or any of these other options, I'm just gonna select the polyline to hatch. Now I don't wanna click within the area. I wanna click the actual object itself. 
And when I do that, hatch pattern is entered and scaled appropriately uh, based on my plot scale that I set earlier. Okay, and then um, I was gonna go into choosing some irrigation items and placing those as well, but irrigation is kind of another uh, beast on its own. But I'll, I'll open up the manager and kind of show you that as well. So that you can see that it's, again, very similar to the other managers we were working in. If you go into FX irrigation and click on the leftmost button, you'll open up the irrigation manager. Uh, the different equipment is categorized by heads, valves, auxiliary equipment, and drip. And then there's a couple uh, new buttons, uh, the source data and the pipe data buttons. So if you want to specify where the water is coming from, you click on the source data. And there are a lot of options with here, within here. I'm not going to go into it. Uh, if you want to have a little bit more depth, uh, intro to irrigation uh, and all these different options, uh, we have a webinar from last January called uh, Getting Started with Irrigation. I would recommend checking that out because it, it goes a lot deeper into these, these introductory uh, aspects. But just so you know, it's here. You have your, your source data. You can set your pipe data uh, for laterals and mainline, set the pipe class. You can set the different sizes for your mainline, lateral, and then also for your sleeves. And then just like the other managers, you click new to add a new object in. So under heads, I have all these different options. Say I want a turf spray. It's gonna bring up those manufacturers and I can add in specific models from manufacturers with the data that they provide. Really handy. So looks like time is going pretty quick. Let's pause here and kind of take a step back and look at what was going on while I did the things that I just did. So let's jump back to my slideshow. So the first thing we did do is we added uh, project data to the drawing. And let me just organize my notes here real quick. Okay, so uh, we, we added a new project. Um, and what a project is, is it's just, uh, it's just it's data that is it's hosted by us. Um, it sits in a database and there's no physical file for your data. Um, but you can back up your data to a to call the .lfx file. And um, if you do that and you take a look at it, you kind of get an idea of kind of what's going on in your projects. So for example, I brought this up just to quickly show, uh, obviously you don't have to know any of this to use LandFX, um, but maybe it'll help understand kind of what's going on in the background. So here's just, when I created that project, this is what I made. Um, and it's very simple. This is an empty project. All it is, it's the name of the project, the, uh, the number, and then I assigned a preference set down to it there on the bottom. Um, nothing in there. However, when I added my ref note items into the project, uh, you can see at the top, that's that bottom box from here. I've, I've now added a bunch of more uh, data objects into the project. So in this uh, jargon of, of code, this is the uh, concrete pavers, uh, which is the ref notes area. You can see that it's an area, uh, pavers, the description, the hatch pattern that was assigned to it. Down here, this is the Maglin bench, uh, the Maglin bench description, the block that is associated now with that Maglin bench. And then here we have some planting stuff. This here is the data for that tree that I chose. You can see that it's plant, uh, the code for the, the plant down below that, you see that it's uh, organized into the trees group. Um, so this is kind of what land effects is doing in the background with your project. It's organizing all of these things together and keeping them tidy um, so that you don't have to do this. And now let's look at the land effects folder and kind of what's happening in a, on a more, uh, I don't know, a physical level, I suppose. Um, 
So uh, this is my land effects folder. Uh, you all have one if you've installed land effects. Uh, it might not be on your C drive. It might be if, if you're in a standalone installation, but if you have an office, office server set up, uh, it could be wherever you've put that. But within land effects, you have all these different folders that houses your content. Um, and I just wanna show the blocks folder real quick. So if I was using land effects for a long time, I would probably have a lot more folders in here because I would be using a lot more items. But because I've only used uh, site amenities and plants and only you know, an instance or two for each, uh, I only have a couple items in here because as you use land effects content, it downloads from our servers to your, your installation folder. Um, so for example, if I go into site amenities, Maglin, site furnishings, uh, this is that, that, uh, that table block. Um, and this block was created by our content team here and uh, saved into, you know, our, uh, our content folder that lives on the cloud that downloads to automatically into yours. Um, and as I used it, the block was downloaded. So if we take a look at this block, just a little understanding of what we've done here. This is a very simple block. Uh, if you don't have properties open, you can open up your properties dialog box uh, by typing PR into the command line and hitting enter. And this is always nice to have open just generally in AutoCAD because whenever you click on an object in CAD, you can see what that object is, what layer it sits on, um, and all these other settings for that. So it's, it's always good to have your properties open in some fashion, uh, just to kind of know what you're working with. But if I select everything for this block that's visible, you'll see it's all on a single layer. The layer is uh, LK-FURN-025M. What that means is that uh, LK is just it's a block layer. Uh, FURN is our indicator for uh, site furnishings. And then 025M is our uh, pen width. Um, and then the color of the layer corresponds to how this prints out in black and white at that, that pen width. If we open up our layers, type in layer at the bottom. Let me dock this. Ooh. Let me dock this in a good way. All right. If you want to dock one of these boxes, you can click on this section here and just drag it over to the side. You should be able to dock it. Um, so all this, this line work, if I select it all, it's all just polylines. It's very simple, uh, sits on this layer, but then there's another layer in here that you wouldn't even have seen unless you have looked at your layers or if you turned on the site color tool and you can turn it on manually here. And what that is, that's just hatches within the block that turn on when you use that tool. So now if we look at the table, in our drawing versus the block file. Let's, uh, let's not look at our XREF layers. Pull this out a little bit. I just wanna show of the things that we've added into the drawing. These are the different layers that are automatically managed and organized by us. Um, so the table, it was brought in. Uh, the table, if you look over here in properties, it sits on L-site-blocks. So all of your different site blocks are gonna fall on that layer. Um, however, the block itself houses the, these two layers here. Um, so I just wanna show that so, uh, so you recognize that uh, we are kind of managing all of these background processes. Uh, so you don't have to, you can simply go in with the vanilla install of LandFX and just start placing stuff in and we've kind of got an organization system that works. Uh, same with the, the tree layer here. These are the different tree layers within that tree symbol. Um, and the tree itself sits on LP tree. So if you wanna turn off all the trees at once, you can freeze this layer. Um, notice that there are some hidden layers within the tree. These are just various gradients of a shadow um, but again, you don't have to manage that through your layer manager. You can use various tools that we have to turn the, on 
the color or turn on the shadow, which is neat. It uh, makes it a lot more user friendly than just using AutoCAD, at least in my opinion. So let's close this. Uh, some other things in our blocks folder you may have seen. So we've got a, an index document, just some data that RelandFX reads. You don't need to worry about that. Um, in our planting folder where the tree symbol lives, there's the block that we downloaded, but then there's all these slides. And those are just those preview slides that you saw when you're choosing the tree symbol. Uh, if you're just curious as to what those were. Okay, time is going. Uh, Jer, if there's any questions right now, I can pause and then uh, afterwards I'll, I'll go through and show some, some cool tools. Um, you know, I think I was able to um, take care of the questions here. So we'll just um, ho um, hold them for a little recap at the end. Okay, excellent. So, so now that we've done just the most basic stuff in land effects, um, we've placed some plants, we saw the data and kind of what's going on in the background. Uh, maybe that's not super flashy, uh, but why it's cool that we have all this data behind our stuff is that it automates all these other processes. And so I kind of want to just show some of the cool stuff you can do um, with uh, that that's directly related to our stuff having data behind it. And if I would just stop zooming in and out, okay. So, um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to demonstrate some tools in the planting ribbon, um, but keep in mind that in the FX site ribbon and the FX irrigation ribbon, um, a lot of the same tools that are available, they might be called something slightly different or have a slightly different function to adhere to that specific module, but uh, a lot of the same tools apply to all the, the different ribbons. So I'm just going to stick with them planting because um, I find it uh, easy to show off. So. Uh, we're not going to go into concept stuff. Um, presentation stuff is for another webinar. But first off, I want to show some different placement options. And so for that, I actually want to add in a couple of shrubs just real quick. Um, what is the name of that? Coleonema. Um, Let's add one of those in and then place it in the drawing. So what we've already done is we placed it one at a time. Notice it's, it's downloading all these different slides because I haven't opened this before. Click OK. Just leave the settings as is. And so I can place a uh, coleonema one at a time, which I've already shown. But notice next to the uh, position in the command line, there is a indicator for keyboard commands. The blue button is the K. So if I press K, it's going to bring up all the different keyboard commands that I can use while placing that plant. And this is really cool. Uh, so the numbers up top, one through zero, um, zero equals 10 in this instance, uh, means that's how many plants you can place at one time. And if you press the button more than once, you get different configurations for that uh, group. Uh, if you have more than one plant in your manager for shrubs or trees, uh, you can go to the next species with uh, Q and E or back a species with Q. So you don't have to end the placement command to move on to a new plant. You can just move through the species one at a time. Um, there's various spacing buttons, uh, copy long line and arc, paint mode, copy along polyline. So I wanna show copy along line which is V. So if I hit V after placing one shrub, suddenly there is a line drawn to my mouse from that initially placed plant and several plants in between. While I'm doing this, before clicking, I can press the S key to change the spacing for to, uh, between best fit and spacing at 100%. If I press the A key, I can uh, decrease the spacing between the plants. And if I press the D key, I can increase the spacing between plants. And I always just press K to kind of go back into the keyboard commands. Uh, and the idea here is to place your left hand 
over the uh, WASD keys with your, your uh, three fingers on your, your left hand, uh, thumb on the space or thumb on the C or V buttons. Um, so you can be effectively working with uh, your mouse hand and your keyboard hand at the same time. If you've ever played a computer game, that's kind of the setup for that. And so once I click my, my spacing setup, I just click to place that line. Um, I can click and press C instead of V, and it's gonna bring me to an arc. And to start the arc off, I wanna start uh, specify the midpoint of the arc, click that midpoint, and then drag my mouse around, and then click to place. So I can effectively place more than one plant at a time with various keyboard commands. Also, let's show a shotgun real quick. So if I press the three key, it's gonna give me three plants, press it again, different configurations. Got those, uh, the D key and the A key rotate, that configuration is the A and the S key, increase and decrease the spacing. So those are some really cool tools to look at while placing a plant for the first time. Uh, say you've already placed some plants and you wanna place some others without going through your giant list in the plant manager. Say, I just want more of this plant in this planting bed. Um, you can go up to match and plant and it's gonna give you a pick box. If you click on that, it's just gonna give you that plant to place more of without having to find it in your manager. So I can just place some more of those plant symbols. Uh, if I am in my, my plan here, I'm looking at properties and it just says it's a block. You know, what plant is this? I don't remember what symbol it is and maybe I have a big list in my plant manager and you don't wanna go through each plant looking at the data to find out what this is. Click on the edit plant button up here and then click on that plant and it's gonna bring up the uh, plant name and all the data behind it. Alternatively, you can select the highlight tool, which is neat. It allows you to select an item or a plant and it'll highlight all of those plants in the drawing so you can easily find out where they all are. And then if you look down at the command line, it tells me the quantity of the plants and the, the plant name. And then just click highlight again to get rid of the highlight. So now that I've placed some of these plants, maybe I wanna just copy them along a line without placing a new one. That's where the copy along tools come in here. You can drop this down, copy along a line, allows you to just select a plant and gives you that uh, copy along line feature. Same with arc, midpoint, stretch your mouse out, click to place, groovy. And then if I delete these, say I have a, a fun design with a polyline. Maybe I want my plants to follow this polyline. I would then choose copy along polyline, click that source plant, select the line, and then draw or just drag my mouse around. And again, you can adjust the spacing along that polyline. So pretty cool, very quick placement of plants. Uh, good ways to in, you know, find out where your plants are, which plants you're using and stay organized uh, without having to go to your layer manager. I didn't have to go into the properties manager. I could have just done everything with tools up here. Uh, another basic and very useful tool is the label tool. So if I want to label all of these shrubs, say I want to label all at once with one label, go to your label, choose the group label, and remember, keep your eye on the command line, uh, select sample plant in group, click a uh, sample plant, that's the plant that the leader is going to attach to, and then draw a window completely around each plant symbol. And then it's gonna give you a label. So 22 of those coleonema, automatically counted up. 
Um, didn't have to type anything in, saving you lots of time. Uh, if there were other plant symbols within that window that I drew, it would ignore those plants and just count up the, the coleonema, which is super handy in uh, tight situations. And so if I wanna now label my area, maybe I'll do a single plant and I'll just select the hatch pattern, drag that out and place it. And it tells me how many of those plants are needed for that area based on the 12 inch on center spacing that I specified earlier. And so I've labeled some plants Maybe you've gone through and labeled a bunch of plants and you want to just verify that all your labels are correct. That's where verify labels comes in handy. It's going to error check for you. <laughs> or not, let's see. Let's, uh, let's delete this label. Um, so it highlights the shrubs that are not labeled. And so if I label, oh, do a group label and draw my window across, fix that error that I made and verify labels, it should correct that. I don't know about this tree though, because I didn't label that. Yeah, it's a, that's a feature. <laughs> no, you didn't, well, you didn't label any trees, so it assumes that was intentional. So, ah. yeah. So now that I've labeled one tree? That's right. Ah, okay. Um, yes, as long as you've labeled at least one tree, it'll actually start looking for trees. Uh, I guess if you're doing a shrubs only plan and there are trees in there, maybe you just wanna verify the shrubs. Um, so we have error checking. Uh, also, if you've accidentally labeled a plant more than once and you verify, it'll highlight those mistakes in a different color, yellow in this case, and let you know uh, which label uh, is errant. So you can just remove it. So of course, once you oh, maybe correctly label everything and run verify labels and everything is proper, you should get a, a nice message telling you that you've done everything well enough and everything's correctly labeled. And then last thing that saves a lot of time is the schedules. Uh, and these are available for all the different modules. Um, and I'll show, I'll show a planting schedule here. You can access the plant schedules in the plant manager here down at the bottom, schedule button, or if you head up to the uh, drop down or fly out menu here, click plant schedule. It's gonna give you a lot of options for how you can uh, display your, your schedule. I'm just gonna leave it as a default. Click okay and click to place. I went ahead and quantified everything. Uh, if I had more data in there and remarks, it would have added that as well. Um, something to notice here is that since I used the plant schedule button last in this flyout menu, it is now the, the button to click on. So if I wanna place another schedule, I don't have to expand the flyout. I can place a schedule. Something handy to note here is that if I make changes to the plant numbers, I can update the number here by clicking the label button. And I can redraw my window, update the number, but then also I can regenerate the schedule by clicking yes, and then clicking on the schedule, and it'll update the quantities or whatever changes you've made to that data. And it has been in one hour, so I will take any questions at this point. 
Well, sounds great. Um, yeah, we definitely got a lot of questions. I was able to type answers to most people. We had, um, for instance, some really good ideas that I think, you know, this is how we operate. <laughs> but uh, Brianna, for instance, had an idea on how would you get that hardscape hatch to uh, to align with like the edge to, to rotate the pattern. And, and I think that's a great idea for, for hardscape hatches. So, um, I, I wouldn't be surprised if we figure out a way to have an R option, which probably would be when placing a hatch, um, something like that um, in the future. So that would be pretty darn slick. Um, it would be then, slick. And then lots of other ones, like um, one that just came in, uh, Jeff asked a quick, a quick question. Um, how would you edit that schedule? Say perhaps you um, edited the container sizes of those plants. How would you then edit the schedule to reflect that? So say you have sizes of plants in here and you want to edit. Yeah, he was just saying, so you know, you've, you've made some edits, for instance, you change the, the sizes of them, add sure. some remarks, and then how do you update the schedule? Okay, yeah, so I just regenerated the schedule like I did when I made uh, some changes to the quantity here. But if I, for this uh, tree, big tree as the remarks, maybe I gave it a, some kind of size. I don't know what size would be appropriate for this tree, but I've updated the data. Maybe I've even updated the symbol for that tree. I just I do those edits here in the plan manager. Uh, the drawing is automatically updated. And now the schedule, I just press that schedule button again. And I choose to say yes to regenerate the schedule. And here we have the size updated to 45 gallons and the remarks big tree. So it's it, just regenerating the schedule will update it with the most current uh, data settings behind those plants. And then, you know, another really good question here. Um, uh, Jennifer was asking how to have a hatch pattern ignore, like for instance, those uh, tables in, in the little uh, courtyard there. Um, and I was thinking really, I, th I think the way I would do it is if you placed a hardscape hatch pattern in that patio um, using something like P-hatch to just knock out where the tables are. And, and that might be a neat thing you could show real quick. Yeah. I actually haven't used PH in a while. Let's see. So we go to place our hatch and this, this tool is really cool. Um, so say I was going to place my pavers. Actually, I already have some place. So I can type P hatch. I can select a hatch and it's going to bring me up some brushes that I need to download the slides for. And I can pick a shape of brush to paint my hatches. And so you can just paint onto the hatch. So if you have some of that hatch down here, say I wanted to just place a little bit, maybe I start in the middle, place the hatch, then I use P hatch, which is also located in is it in the, the home tab it of the ribbon? It should be also um, even under the, the hatch um, um, ribbon button thing. Ah, yeah. there it is. So P hatch, if you don't want to type in that command. So the way that works is you just select your sample hatch pattern and then you have your different brush shapes that you choose from. And then you can start actually just clicking as if it were a, a paintbrush and it'll augment that boundary of the hatch and start going around. And there are keyboard commands if you want to be more precise. I believe uh, A and D, rotate. So if I want to try to match that angle of these tables, maybe I put the tables in at a better angle, but I can get up close um, and paint in, you can up the size as well to get a bigger area, You're just using the A, or the, sorry, the W key. So this is a, it's a fun way to kind of get uh, some more complex 
hatch boundary shapes uh, on the fly if you have very specific uh, shapes. Um, otherwise, but don't what? forget the uh, the tilde key for to remove hatch. Otherwise, you can simply say you have a circle here. Oop. C is no longer a circle for some reason. <laughs> um, so C for circle. Say we place the concrete pavers within that circle. There we go. And then we go to p-hatch. Let's look at the keyboard commands after we select the hatch. So these are the different options you have with that p-hatch. So tilde is the add subtract. So if I want to remove hatches, I can press that tilde. I can then maybe just cut out. Do you have to cut out from the boundary? Ah. It should it's not, it should let you do it right in the middle, but I guess um, yeah, yeah. Always, you know, that's the thing with like this one is people send us like an unusual shape that they perhaps for whatever reason weren't able to use p hatch on, um, and are able to improve the logic in it to to see um, how it can be a little bit better. Um, but yeah, it definitely is a is a fun one to play with. Yeah, I enjoy uh, p hatch quite a bit. Um, and then if you just say so you have a circle here, it's your area. I'm using the multiple command. So I've pressed multiple, select the outer boundary, select the inner boundary, and it actually ignores that shape on the interior, which is how I would go about ignoring um, areas like the table. But the paving would go under the table, so you'd probably want to count that. Um, but if, say, if you're using a ground cover and you wanted to exclude uh, shrubs, we have an exclude button for that. It acts kind of like the multiple where you can click on the shrubs and it'll not place the ground cover underneath the shrubs. Actually, I think didn't we, I think Amanda even recently did a power tip on exactly that on either, um, you know, excluding the hatch or just um, applying a solid to the the bench so it just shows over the hatch. So lots of ways. Yeah, uh, yeah, it was yeah, it was pretty recently. Uh, I do recall that one. But yeah, it is, you're still working AutoCAD, so it's important to remember that. There are kind of a lot of ways to tackle various uh, design, uh, either problems or, or hurdles that you're coming across. Uh, luckily, you know, CAD allows for just a lot of different ways to go about things. Um, but if you have any issues uh, with placing certain items or questions, uh, our you know, inbox is always open. Uh, send us a, a message at support at landeffects.com or just call us at the office, you know, pose your question. If it's not a feature already, uh, we are always developing new things. So we'd love to hear some input on uh, cool new features you might have in mind. Yeah, definitely. A lot of good ideas that came up in the questions. Wasn't able to, to say out loud, but I'll definitely be going over that with uh, Paul and the, and the rest of the team here. Um, a few really neat uses of plant colorization came up. Um, and so some just new ideas that will inevitably end up being future power tips or webinars or, or new features. So stay tuned. Um, but other than that, everybody have a great weekend. All right. Thank you, everyone.